Sova, with her daughters and a considerable number of guests, were sitting in the drawing-room. The Count had taken the men into his cabinet and was showing them his favorite collection of Turkish pipes. Occasionally he would go out and ask, "'Hasn't she come yet?' They were waiting for Maria Dmitrievna Akrosimova, called in society La Terrible Dragon, a lady who was distinguished not for her wealth or her titles, but for the honesty of her character and her frank, simple ways. The imperial family knew her, all Moscow knew her, and all Petersburg, and both cities, while they laughed at her on the sly and related anecdotes of her brusque manners nevertheless, without exception, respected and feared her. The conversation in the cabinet, which was full of smoke, turned on the war which had just been declared through a manifesto in regard to the recruiting. No one had, as yet, read the manifesto, but all were aware of its appearance. The Count was sitting on a low ottoman between two of his friends, who were talking and smoking. He himself did not smoke and did not talk, but, inclining his head now to one side, now to the other, he looked with manifest satisfaction at those who did, and listened to the conversation of his two friends, whom he had already set by the ears. One of the men was a civilian, with a wrinkled, sallow, lean and cleanly shaven face. Though he was approaching old age, he was dressed in the height of style, like a young man. He was sitting with his feet on the ottoman, like a man thoroughly at home, and holding the amber mouthpiece at one side of his mouth, was sucking strenuously at the smoke, and frowning over the effort. This was the old bachelor, Shinchin, the countess's own cousin, a venomous tongue, as it was said of him in Moscow drawing-rooms. He talked as though it were an act of condescension toward his opponent. The other— a fresh, ruddy young officer of the guard, irreproachably belted, buttoned, and barbered, held the mouthpiece in the middle of his mouth, and gently sucked the smoke through his rosy lips, sending it out in rings from his handsome mouth. This was Lieutenant Berg, an officer of the Semyonovsky regiment, with whom Boris was going to the army, the very person about whom Natasha had teased Viera by calling him her lover. The Count was sitting between these two, and listening attentively. The occupation that the Count enjoyed most, next to the game of Boston, of which he was very fond, was that of listener, especially when he had a chance to get two good talkers on the opposite sides of an argument. "'Well now, Batyushka, my most honorable Alfonso Kerlich, said Shinshin, with a sneer, and, as his custom was when he talked, mixing up the most colloquial Russian expressions with the most refined French idioms. Your idea is to make money out of the state. You expect to get a nice little income from your company, do you? Not at all, Pyotr Nikolaitch. I only wish to prove that the advantages of serving in the cavalry are far less than in the infantry. You can now imagine my position, Pyotr Nikolaitch. Berg always spoke very accurately calmly and politely. His conversation invariably had himself as its central point. He always preserved a discreet silence when people were talking about anything that did not directly concern himself, and he could sit that way silently for hours, without feeling or causing others to feel the slightest sense of awkwardness. But as soon as the conversation touched any subject in which he was personally interested, he would begin to talk at length, and with evident satisfaction. Consider my position, Pyotr Nikolaitch. If I were in the cavalry, I should not receive more than two hundred a quarter, even with the rank of lieutenant. But now I get two hundred and thirty, said he, with a pleasant, joyful smile, glancing at Shinshin and the Count, as though it were plain for him that his success would always be an object of interest to everybody else. Moreover, Pyotr Nikolaitch, continued Berg. By being transferred to the guard, I am in sight. Vacancies in the infantry occur far more often. Then, you can see for yourself, on two hundred and thirty roubles a quarter, how well I can live. I can lay up some, and send some to my father, too. 
he went on to say, puffing out a spiral of smoke. That's where the difference lies. A German can grind corn on the butt of his hatchet, as the proverb puts it, said Shin Shin, shifting the mouthpiece of his pipe to the other side of his mouth and winking at the Count. The Count laughed heartily. The other guests, seeing that Shin Shin was engaged in a lively conversation, crowded round to listen. Berg, remarking neither the quizzical nor indifferent looks of the others, proceeded to explain how, by his transfer to the guard, he would attain rank before his comrades of the corpus, how, in time of war, the company commanders were apt to be killed, and he, if left the senior in the company, might very easily become a captain, and how everybody in the regiment liked him, and how proud of him his papenka was. Berg evidently took great delight in telling all this, and he never seemed to suspect that other people had also their interests. But all that he said was so suavely serious, the naivete of his youthful egotism was so palpable, that he quite disarmed his auditors. Well, my lad, whether you are in the infantry or in the guard, you will get on, that I can predict, said Shin Shin, tapping him on the shoulder and setting his feet down from the ottoman. Berg smiled with self-satisfaction. The Count, followed by his guests, passed into the drawing-room. It was the time, just before dinner is announced, when the assembled guests, in expectation of being summoned to partake of the Zakuska, are disinclined to entering any detailed conversation and, at the same time, feel that it is incumbent upon them to stir about and say something, in order to show that they are in no haste to sit down. The host and hostess keep watching the dining door and exchange glances from time to time. The guests try to read in those glances for whom or for what they are waiting, some belated influential connection, or for some dish that is not done in time. Pierre came in just before the dinner hour, and awkwardly sat down in the first chair that he saw, right in the middle of the drawing-room, so that he was in everybody's way. The countess tried to engage him in conversation, but he merely answered her questions in monosyllables, and kept looking naively around him through his spectacles, as though in search of someone. It was exceedingly annoying, but he was the only person who did not notice it. The majority of the guests, knowing about his adventure with the bear, looked curiously at this big, tall, quiet-looking man, and found it difficult to believe that such a burly, unassuming creature could have played such a trick on a police officer. "'Have you only just come?' asked the Countess. "'Oui, madame,' replied he, glancing around. "'You have not seen my husband?' "'No, madame,' and he smiled at absolutely the wrong time. "'You were in Paris lately, I believe. "'I think it is very interesting.' Very interesting. The countess exchanged glances with Anna Mikhailovna, who perceived that she was wanted to take charge of this young man. She took a seat by his side and began to talk to him about his father, but he answered her, just as he had the countess, merely in monosyllables. The other guests were all engaged in little groups. Le Razumonsky. That was charming. You are very good. La Comtesse Aprocassine, were the broken phrases that were heard on all sides. The Countess got up and went into the hall. "'Is that you, Maria Dmitrievna?' rang her voice through the hall. "'My own self,' was the answer, in a harsh voice, and immediately after, Maria Dmitrievna entered the room. All the young ladies, and even the married women, except those who were aged, rose, Marya Dmitrievna paused in the doorway. She was tall and erect, fifty years old, and wore her grey hair in ringlets. Under the pretext of turning back and adjusting the wide sleeves of her dress, she took a deliberate survey of all the guests. Marya Dmitrievna always spoke in Russian. "'Congratulations to the dear ones,' said she, in her loud, deep voice, which drowned all other sounds." "'Well, you old sinner, how are you?' she said, addressing the Count, who kissed her hand. 
I suppose you are bored to death in Moscow, eh? No chance to let out the dogs. Well, what's to be done, Batyushka, when you have these birds already grown up? She waved her hand toward the young ladies. Whether you wish it or no, you've got to find husbands for them. Well, my Cossack, said she. Maria Dmitrievna always called Natasha the Cossack, smoothing Natasha's hair as she came running up to kiss her hand gaily and without any fear. I know that this little girl is a madcap, but I am fond of her all the same. She took out of a monstrous reticule a pair of pear-shaped amethyst earrings and gave them to the blushing Natasha in honor of her name-day. Then she turned immediately upon Pierre. He, he, my dear, come here, right here, she cried in a pretended gentle voice. Come here, my dear fellow, and she threateningly pulled her sleeve still higher. Pierre went to her, ingenuously looking at her through his spectacles. Come here, come, my dear fellow, I have been the only one who dared tell your father the whole truth when he required it, and now I shall do the same in your case. It's God's will. She paused. All held their breath, waiting for what was to come, and feeling that this was but the prologue. He's a fine lad, I must say, a fine lad, his father lying on his deathbed, and this young man amuses himself by tying a policeman on a bear's back. For shame, Batyushka, for shame. You would better have gone to the war." She turned away from him and gave her hand to the Count, who found it difficult to keep from laughing outright. "'Well, then, to dinner. It is ready, I believe,' said Marya Dmitrievna. The Count led the way with Marya Dmitrievna, followed by the Countess, escorted by the Colonel of Hussars, a man to be made much of, since Nikolai was to join his regiment. Anna Mikhailovna went in with Shinshin. Berg gave his arm to Viera. The smiling Julie Karagina went with Nikolai to the table. Behind them followed the rest of the couples, making a long line through the hall, and the rear was brought up by the tutors and governesses, each leading one of the children. The waiters bustled about, chairs were noisily pushed back, an orchestra was playing in the gallery, and the guests took their places. The sounds of the Count's private band were soon drowned in the clatter of knives and forks, the voices of the guests, and the hurrying steps of the waiters. At the head of the table sat the Countess, Maria Dmitrievna at her right, Anna Mikhailovna at her left, then the other ladies. At the other end of the table sat the Count, with the Colonel of Hussars at his left, and Shinshin and the other men at his right. At one side of the long table were the young gentlemen and ladies, Viera next to Berg, Pierre and Boris together, all facing the children and their guardians on the other side. The Count, through the long line of decanters and vases with fruits, looked across to his wife and her towering headdress with its blue ribbons, and zealously helped his neighbors to wine, not forgetting himself. The Countess also, not neglecting the duties of a hostess, cast significant glances at her husband over the tops of the pineapples, and it seemed to her that his bald forehead and face were all the more conspicuously rubicund from the contrast of his grey hair. On the lady's side there was an unceasing buzz of conversation. On the side of the men the voices grew louder and louder. And loudest of all talked the colonel of hussars, who ate and drank all that he could, his face growing more and more flushed, so that the Count felt called upon to hold him up to the other guests as an example. Berg, with an affectionate smile, was talking with Viera on the theme of love being not an earthly but a heavenly feeling. Boris was enlightening his new friend Pierre as to the guests who were at the table, and occasionally exchanged glances with Natasha, who was seated on the opposite side. Pierre himself said little, but he ate much, while he scanned the faces of the guests. Having been offered two kinds of soups, he had chosen turtle, and from the fish kulabyaka to the sauté of woodcock he did not refuse a single dish, or any of the wines which the butler offered him, thrusting the bottle mysteriously wrapped in a white napkin over his neighbor's shoulder, murmuring, 
dry Madeira, or Hungarian, or Rhine wine. He held up the first that he had happened to lay his hand upon, of the four wine glasses, engraved with a count's arms, that stood before each guest, and drank rapturously, and the face that he turned upon the guests grew constantly more and more friendly. Natasha, sitting opposite, gazed at Boris, as young girls of thirteen only can on the lad with whom they have just exchanged kisses and are very much in love. Occasionally she let her eyes rest on Pierre, and this glance of the ridiculous little maiden, so lively in all her ways, almost made him feel like laughing. He could not tell why. Nikolai was seated at some distance from Sonya, and next to Julie Karagina, and was again talking with her with the same involuntary smile. Sonya also had a smile on her lips, but it was not natural, and she was evidently tortured with jealousy. First she turned pale, then red, and was trying with all her might to imagine what Nikolai and Julie were talking about. The governess was looking around nervously, as though ready to make resistance should anyone presume to injure her young charges. The German tutor was endeavoring to fix in his memory all the different courses, desserts, and wines, so as to give a full description of it when he wrote home to Germany. He felt sorely grieved because the butler who had the bottle wrapped in the napkin passed him by. He frowned and tried to make it appear that he had no wish to taste that wine, and was only affronted because no one was willing to see that he needed the wine not for allaying his thirst, or from greediness, but from motives of mere curiosity. End of chapter 16